All right, everybody. After a little bit of a hiatus, American Baitworks Live is back on the air right now. And one of the coolest things about this newest edition of American Baitworks Live is we've got, a, as always, we have cool guests. But we've got a guest this time that we've never had before. Everybody welcome my buddy, Sean Aruda. How you doing, man? Good. How are you, JT? Absolutely outstanding. It was a beautiful day down here in Florida. Um, didn't actually get to fish today, but probably be out there tomorrow. But one of the cool things is very different from what I did uh, the other day fishing here in Florida. Today, we're going to talk to our new buddy, Sean, about some ice fish. And for all of you that are out there, you're thinking JT lives down in Florida, lives in Palm Bay, <laughs> down in Marsh, catching all those fish. So believe it or not, I've actually been ice fishing a few times. Um, and, and I just talked with Sean just for a couple of minutes about ice fishing right before we went on the air. And one of the things I have to admit, and, and, and everybody knows that, that, that I like, I love to eat fish, not necessarily bass so much or muskies or anything like that, but like, you know, like panfish, I love to eat panfish and man, some of the best eating fish, in my opinion, to come out of freshwater. Cause you guys know I do a little saltwater fishing too. But some of them, my absolute favorite eating fish to come out of freshwater is bluegill and perch from under the ice. You know, the yellow perch or ring perch, as, as they call them in some places. Um, but, man, that is some of my absolute favorite fish to eat. So I am really pretty stoked to get to talk to Sean tonight for a little while about ice fishing. And we're going to talk about some techniques. We're going to talk about some baits. We're going to talk about some of the places that we fish and maybe some little tricks and techniques. I know a lot of the guys, you know, up on the up on the northern part of the continent, you know, the, it is ice fishing time right now. You guys are ice fishing for sure. And, and man, I, you know, like I said, I've only done it a few times, but I want to get the scoop about it. So, so Sean, tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of about your, your experiences and what you've been doing with ice fishing, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, I uh, live up north. Um, when we stay up north, it's uh, approximately four hours from Toronto. I don't know if you're familiar with Toronto, so it's uh, pretty. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty far up north here. Um, so we get a lot of ice. I live on uh, Lake Nipissing. It's one of probably the most popular ice fishing destinations uh, in Ontario. So, and it's a quite a quite a large lake, and uh, I run a guide service as well up here for ice fishing. Um, we have uh, we have the only snow bear. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what a snow bear is, but it's uh, like a big snowmobile, pretty much. Okay. Uh, so that's that's pretty cool, and you fish right in it, and it's got heat in it and everything. Nice, that's pretty yeah, cool. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, species walleye, perch, pike. No, no bluegill, and I, I have to admit, I've never even eaten bluegill before, so I'm going to have to take your word on it that it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. That was one of the things I was going to ask you, because I've never been to Lake Nipissing before, but I've seen it on the map. I'm kind of a geographical guy. I get bored. I look at Google Earth a lot. So I've seen it on there. So you are getting pretty far up there. Is there even any bass up that way? Of course, i got to bring bass up, but is there even any bass up there, yeah. smallmouth? <laughs> It's uh, it's actually a really good bass lake because most people target walleye and they can muskie. Right. So the bass are not targeted at all. So our, our bass tournaments, which I fish as well, um, if you don't got, you know, 20, 22 pounds, that don't even show up to the scales pretty much. Wow. So there's good largemouth in, in uh, July and August, and there's great smallmouth throughout the entire year. Nice. Nice. We've already got it. Yeah. We've already got a few people kind of uh, chiming in here a little bit. Alicia says, "Hey, hey, hey!" Tim Robinson, he's in. We got Tyler coming in. Um, we got Manny saying that he's going to be going there this weekend. Nice. I will not be, but I would be loving a report. <laughs> um, and Chase says, "Hey, guys, that's good to hear from some people. You know, chiming in already." Um, what, so how long have you had ice up there right now? How long have you been ice fishing? You know, this year? This uh, 
this year it, it, it's been a late year it's it hasn't been as cold as it normally is and um it's probably uh our season only starts on this lake on lake nipissing on january 1st so we've only been fishing for six days pretty much here but in the surrounding back lakes for the trout lakes and stuff people have been fishing for about i'd say a month um usually it we're behind about two weeks right now it's uh it's pretty pretty crazy we only got about uh, 10 inches of ice and normally at this time we got well over a foot and we'll finish the season off with well over two feet of ice nice that's that's a serious power auger deal right there like like you're you're not you're not out there doing that by hand like uh, no, you got a two no. and a half or two motor doing that yeah exactly right. and you got the extension on there and everything to get nice and deep to get through all that ice yeah <clears throat> Tell me, like, so you're basically just getting started right now. Do the fish move throughout the year? Like, like, uh, and when I say throughout the year, like the ice fishing year, like, do, do they move to different areas as it, I don't know if it really gets colder or just as the, you know, obviously we're, we're in the pattern where the days are starting to get longer already, even though it's kind of middle of winter, but you know, the days are starting to get longer. So obviously you know, with the lunar and astronomical tables, stuff's changing. So do, do they move throughout your ice fishing season? Oh, they definitely do. Um, they move a lot. A lot of people don't realize that. But in the beginning of the ice season, when the ice isn't as thick too, there's a lot of light penetration. So they'll they'll go into the weedy areas still, wherever there's a lot, wherever there's live weeds still. Um, and then at night and then in the morning, they'll come up to the flats and, and feed as well, right? And then they'll go down deeper throughout the day. And uh, then throughout the throughout the season, not even the season, it's like it's almost week for week. They start moving out deeper, and then they get to a point that they're in the deep basins of the of the lakes. Um, and then when the season gets closer to the end, like in March, they start coming in shallow again because now they're going to get ready to spawn. Mm -hmm. So they start coming in shallow, and uh, and and then you're targeting them at different depths. So. So running an ice fishing business out here, we're constantly moving our our ice bungalows and uh, uh, to different spots uh, in the lake uh, just to stay on top of the fish for our customers. So is most of the time, is it walleye that you're typically targeting most of the time? Well, most of the time on this lake here, walleye is probably 75% what you're targeting. Uh, some guys go after the big northern pikes. Um, and then there's a, there's a great perch bite too, the yellow perch, like you were saying. Um, so those are, those are the three. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And you know what? Um, every year there's probably a couple dozen smallmouth bass caught through the, through the ice too, you know, so they, they get hungry too. They don't, they don't just hibernate. They got to eat too. <laughs> I mean, they're cold blooded. So they slow down a little bit, but they're, they don't quit that those fish. You know they they eat all year long and, and and speaking of that let's hit a couple people we we got walter jones on here he says do you ever catch any bass while you're ice fishing walter yeah we're actually we actually just right there he said they catch a few dozen uh every year we got tom's coming in he's just saying cold i don't know if he likes that or not jared saying hi jt we got uh Upstate New York here who's this from rich upstate New York saying we're getting some good ice there now so they'll be They'll be ice fishing up there too, and you know what else they do in upstate New York in the winter time? Um, the Salmon River, they do a lot of uh, fishing along there for the uh, uh, rainbow. I don't think they call them rainbow trout; I think they call them something else. But but they're basically steelhead, probably. Steel. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Steelhead. I actually went up there and did that once. That was pretty fun. Um, but yeah, we've got we've got a lot of people uh, hitting us in already. Here, David is saying uh, he's got a question. What do you target to, to determine a good location to auger? That's a, I'd love to hear the answer to that question myself because I, I, I'm used to doing everything out of a boat. So you're essentially on a boat. Do you have a sonar that, that can actually look through the ice or do you have to drill a hole so your sonar can look through? How if, if, the ice, if the ice isn't that thick and if it's clear black ice, Technically, if you put your transducer on the ice, there's no snow around, you could see through the ice. It's That's a very rare occasion. Most of the yeah. time, you're punching holes, 
you're dropping your sonar, you're dropping a, you know, you're dropping a turn back shad, and you're seeing if there's any active fish coming up on your sonar. If they're not, you're moving within five minutes. Um, a good buddy of mine was out fishing last weekend. I asked him how he did. He said, we got about 30 walleye. I said, how many holes did you punch? He said, 60. Ooh. So that's a, that's a lot of augering, 60 holes, right? So, <clears throat> yeah, but but when you're looking for where you want to auger, a, a lot of people think ice fishing only starts when the ice is on, but it actually starts in the fall. In the fall, when we're bass fishing, we're, we're looking at our sonars in our boats for great walleye areas too because they're going to move in there in October and November, and they're going to stay there. So we start marking those spots for our winter fishing. So it's almost like planning ahead, and uh, we really get into uh, get into some good fish that way. Now I have a question for you. One of the things that that kind of works down here in the states too, believe it or not, even though we're we're not really dealing with ice. But I, I heard you at the beginning of when we started talking. I heard you say something about the weeds and the green weeds. So is that something that you guys look for is, is the grass that doesn't die off, that still that still stays kind of what I'll call crisp and green? Yes, you wanna, if you could find that, that crisp green grass still, um, that, that is a great to target those edges, a great, great time to target those edges. Uh, another great transition is uh, rock to sand, so gravel to mud, uh, mm -hmm. anything like that. If you could find those locations, it's it's amazing. When, when you're when you're fishing in a bigger lake like this, and I know the lake, I really don't have to, you know, I look at the map, you know where to kind of go. If sure. you're new to a lake, these new sonars that have, you know, 360s and everything, you drop them in the hole and they're looking 200 feet all around you. You'll be able to find, you know, individual boulders, anything like that, and then just go over and drill. So it saves a lot of time. Yep, go over, just go over there and drill another hole. No, absolutely. You know, one of the things you just said uh, about the, you know, the crisp grass and all that, that's something that we do down here in Florida and, and like I said, in the southern part of the states, um, you know, in, in the colder months. I remember I had a, a big tournament on Gunnersville one year. Uh, Gunnersville is northern Alabama, a uh, real popular bass fishing lake down here. And, and uh, I found one little, uh, it was a great big hydrilla field. I'm not even going to call it a hydrilla bed. It was a field of hydrilla. And somehow I stumbled into one little area in there that the grass was just crisp and green. I was throwing a lipless crankbait and you could just rip your lipless crankbait through that grass and it wouldn't get, like if you got out of that area around the other grass that was dead, it was like snotty kind of, and it would hang on your bait. But when you were in that one area and, and I ended up, I didn't win, but I finished like, you know, third or fourth or something in that tournament. And that was the deal was that one little area where that grass was still crisp. So it's neat to me and, and why I'm bringing this up so much. It's so neat to me to see stuff that, that like I'm talking about Northern Alabama and you're talking about like Nipissing that's four hours North of Toronto. You know, you're really starting to get up there. Like we were talking earlier, you're on the northern end of even where bass even live, on the northern end of their range. <laughs> the similarities are so amazing. You know, I'm a big hunter, too, and I hunt every place from Florida to Montana and Ohio and everything. And and it's I see the same thing in hunting is a deer is a deer is a deer, regardless of where he lives. So of course, there's local differences and stuff, but he's still a deer. Yeah. He still wants cover, still likes edges of things, still likes to be close to the food. A fish, whether it's a walleye or a bass, is still, it likes that. I think that green grass, and this is just my opinion, could be wrong. I'm wrong a lot. That's my girlfriend. But, but <laughs> I think that green grass it's still put, it's alive. It's still putting out oxygen through photosynthesis. You know what I mean? So it's just a healthy area where all that other grass, it's, you know, it's not producing oxygen and it's not, you know, it's just, it's just not as, as good of an area. So that, that's kind of my little two cents on that thing. And another interesting thing that you said, something that I look for in the Great Lakes all the time, and we're up there, we have tournaments on the Great Lakes for smallmouth. You said there's rock to sand transitions. Man, there's certain, and, and, and they don't work all the time, but when they 
when they're on that rock to sand transition, you can't compete any other way when they're on that. Like you side scan and you find some rocks kind of coming down and then it ends just in a sand flat. They're all on that when they're on it. Yeah. They're not always on it, but when they're on that rock to sand, and sometimes they're even like they're even like like 30 or 40 yards off the rock out on the sand, just on the sand, just for I don't know, whatever reason. But man, when they're on that deal, it's it's amazing. And and so you're saying that these walleye kind of act like that too. Yes, exactly. And and then one of the nicknames for walleye actually is sand lizards. So uh well or gravel lizards too. So it's it's perfect, right? Um, I remember a time I, that, that we got onto a rock sand transition and uh, within four or five hours, we had a hundred. Wow. Right? It, was, it was insane. It was insane. Anything you drop down, it was just right up with a fish. Uh, like you said, when they're on, they're on, you know, yeah. and, and the whole thing too is because uh, there's going to be bait fish, right? There's going to be little perch and stuff like that around and uh, they're going to want that. Whether it's a smallmouth or a, or a walleye, you know that's what that's what it is. It's whatever was keeping the bait fish there because they're going to be where they have a little bit of cover and where the food is. That's all they care about, you know. So yeah. other than storing spawn, uh, you know, of course that changes things, but but that's really all they care about. It's funny you you said sand lizards though. So I had a buddy growing up in Maryland. I was I was telling you earlier, and some of the people that watch the show all the time know I'm originally from Maryland, but we had a lake that had a lot of walleye in it up up in the mountains of Maryland called Deep Creek Lake. And there was a buddy of mine up there. He used to call walleyes moon eyes. And what he would actually do, and I don't know if this was legal or not, but this was 25 or 30 years ago. So I think the statute of limitations <laughs> is probably passed by now. But what he would do, live seriously, to find them, because we loved catching walleyes because they're, they're really good eating. But he would literally go out after dark and take a spotlight and shine you know it, it had the water had to be flat you know what i mean it couldn't be ripply yeah. it had to be flat water but he'd go back in those coves in the early spring and he'd actually shine the light in the water and i couldn't believe it but you could see that you know because they have those big eyes you could see their eyes and you could see the schools of them and you could figure out which coves they were spawning in that year and then we could go back in there later on and go back in there and catch them or the next day and go back in there and catch them. But he called them moon eyes because, you know, like yeah. that spot was like the moon and he would shine that spotlight around. And that's how he found them. It was it was genius. Like I said, I don't know if it was legal, but it was 25 years ago. So <laughs> I think we're probably OK. But that that was that was an interesting, interesting thing. So so to get back to something I heard you say a little bit ago, and this happens on American Bait Works Live all the time is myself and the guests kind of go off on these tangents and go one way or the other. And sometimes they're entertaining and sometimes they're not, but you had said <laughs> about drilling the hole and then you're dropping back down a turn back shad. Now I know what a yeah. turn back shad is, but for everybody that's listening, give me a little bit of a backstory and kind of how you, there he is, how you use that guy. Uh so this is one of the ultimate, uh, walleye baits, in my opinion. Um, people just think it's for ice fishing. Actually, in the spring and the fall, um, fishing one of these for walleye is is unbelievable. Um, so this is an all metal body turn back shad. One of the one of the benefits I like of this, it does not have a hook in the front, so your hook does not get stuck on the ice, which is very important because that's how a lot of people lose their fish. And uh, these swim around a lot. So they will tangle your line, but these ones are free floating. So Freedom made a free floating one, so it doesn't tangle your line, which is amazing. Um, and they have their patented uh, quick connect uh, hook here that if you need to put on another hook. Um, but these are these are great, and they're a great search bait <clears throat> um, to find the fish. Be you know be before you slow it down. Um, but you find the fish with something like this is, you know, it, it, it's a search bait for us on the ice, you know, just, just like that. So, uh, they, they recently came out with the blade bait, which is, which is just as, just as effective here. Um, this one, I, I removed the hooks that were on the front. I like the hook just on the back here, but, uh, 
you could rip this up the hole as well and and it uh it attracts a lot of the fish here and uh and you see what's around and and even if you don't catch them you'll see them on your sonar so you know that you'll have to hey they're around so let's you know let's downsize or or let's upsize and let's go to live bait or let's go to something else or some plastics and stuff like that so so yeah the turn back shad um and this is the orange fire tiger the uh, orange tiger actually this is it's probably my favorite color um uh for for ice fishing um it, it's it's awesome that's pretty cool. I've actually got to use those turnback shads a little bit, not through the ice, but I've got to use them a little bit, just kind of playing with them. And man, sometimes, like I said, not through the ice, just, you know, down here fish, they go on that really small bait. And I've, I've, caught, I've caught a lot of fish on those. Let's run through a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, comments we've got. Jason says, looking forward to visiting Sean later this winter for some ice fishing. That's pretty cool. Looks like you got, uh, you got a guy coming. Theo says, I sight fish smallies all the time, ice fishing in Michigan. <laughs> I'm sure they're not on the bed, but I'm sure you probably can see them through there. Kurt says, we do a lot of drinking in upstate New York. Go Bills. Yes. Ah, yes. yes. I, I've, I've, I, I've been to a Bills game, and I could I could confirm that. I've been to a Bills game. I could confirm that. I, heard, I actually heard you can go to a Bills game, but you cannot go out to eat in that state, which is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elliot says Moberg Ice Derby here this weekend in South Dakota, Missouri River. Nice. Apparently, they've got plenty of ice in, in the Missouri River. Uh, Russell hits us and says, JT, is that Pepsi in the cup? No, that is not Pepsi in my cup, by the way. Uh, let's see what Jesse has to say. Here's a good question What's a go to Eastern Ontario? walleye pattern this time of year so i'm gonna say eastern ontario is south of you maybe down around toronto a little bit or something what should those guys be looking for down there yeah so there that's that's more out the ottawa area so it's, it's about south uh, southeast of me um by about four hours but uh they're very similar to to what you would be looking for up here um if you could find a hump on your on your map sit on a hump and if you sit on a hump you're gonna be good those those walleye will come up to that hump to start feeding in the uh the what we call a witching hour um so usually just before just before dusk and and you'll be on fire for at least an hour um humps out in this lake are prime real estate <laughs> you gotta jump on them fast if you're not out there uh in time all the humps are gone but that's what you want you want that that, that depth transition they're gonna come up and feed, so that that's the greatest pattern right now out there. So, Sean, let me let me ask you a question. So, and once again, I'm fairly naive at ice fishing. Well, I might be naive at a lot of stuff too, but but as far as the ice fishing thing goes, but can, so so I take it most of the time you run on a snowmobile. Is that am I not mistaken? Is that kind of how you're getting around? Or, or let's say the average guy, maybe not you, running a guide <laughs> surf. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've got all the co all the coolest stuff, but but it, it, would I not be mistaken thinking that most guys probably are on a, are on a snowmobile doing that? Yeah, yeah. So ninety percent of the guys are on a snowmobile. They have a little sleigh behind them pulling their gear. Um, yeah, or or you know side by sides have become really popular up here as well, uh, especially are, that you get them you get them enclosed and everything. So. You know, oh, yeah. you get them enclosed, and when it's minus 20, minus 30 out, <laughs> you don't freeze. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this. So so I, I'm just going to assume these guys are mounting a GPS with like a C map or something, you know, so they can drive around out there on the snowmobile, but they can see yeah. I'm pulling up on a hump, I'm pulling up on a little point sticking off a hump. You know, so basically, they're it's like being out there in a boat in the summertime, only you have to drill a hole once you get there. Is that kind of how it's going down? That's exactly how it goes down. Everyone has electronics on their ATV, side by side, snow bears, you know. And if you don't, if I if I if I'm out on something that I don't have one, then I'm going to my cell phone and I'm going to an app that has a map uh, that has a uh, that has a map on it. So. Um, that is that is what everyone does, and then you look for those little fingers, those depth transitions, those sharp breaks, those humps, and you and you just sit on those. 
So, so I know you talked a little bit about it. We were talking about the blade bait and the turnback shad, both from Freedom Lures. Um, what do you do as far as technique? Maybe let's let's use both of those for example. You hit on it a little bit, but so so what's our average depth? Uh, just say if you're going fishing tomorrow, are you fishing 12 feet, 16 feet, 32 feet, and and, and probably fishing. Probably around 20 feet if I was to go tomorrow. Now, is it kind of like a, a short little just hops or do you, can you, do you crack it sometimes? Like, like, like run down like a scenario, say just like tomorrow morning when you get out on the water, like I mean, 20 feet, I got this area, I'm going I'm to bang out a couple of holes. Yeah. What are we going to do next? Yeah. So like, like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to start with the, with the turn back shad and I'm going to give it big ups and downs with it and it'll it'll literally swim around cover a large area um to attract all those fish once i start seeing them on the on the sonar and if they're not hitting this which i would be very surprised if they're not um i, I would go to something that has a little bit more flash and a little bit more slow fall um this is one of freedom's uh, original uh freedom minnow and and this I know guys that will just fish this all season long and that's wow. it that the, nothing that's else like comes off yeah and and you know I, I i've had guys and i asked them well what'd you catch them on and they go oh i just put on the freedom minnow and and, and i caught fish all day you know a lot of people is going to ask um uh, everyone asks, do you tip these with anything so live bait a lot of people use live bait in in the winter time um we usually, if we're going to tip them, we're going to tip them just with the minnow head. We don't even need the body. <laughs> we is just that, want the head. Is that just for a little, as we call it, is that just for a little stink? Is that, all, is that yeah, what you're looking for? Yeah, just a little stink, a little meat. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you just, you, you put it on the middle hook here and, uh, and that's it. And, and even on the turn back shad, um, I've put, I've put it on here as well. Just, just the head on there and, and, uh, it gives it that little extra, you know, they come up and sniff and they're going to want it after, um, right. instead of just having a full of, full of lead. On that, on that turn back shad where you got, you were talking about how you can cover a lot of water and that's an interesting thing because you think of ice fishing, you're just dropping it straight down in the hole. Kind of show us the back of that of that freedom turn back shad and, and you can see how the water will plane it there. You can, you can see it pretty good there, how it's, it's for lack of a better term misshapen, but that allows that yeah. bait to really swim around as you're dropping it down. And once it's down towards the bottom, it's interesting. Yeah, it literally will, it'll, it'll go out. Uh, I've seen it go out the good, you know, 10 feet this way and then just come back and turn back. And, and that's where that, that's where they got the name actually, uh, Michael. Um, that's, I asked him, how'd you get the name for that? He goes, when we're, when we're prototyping it, we noticed that we, we jig it up and it swim out and then it turned back and there, there it is, right? The turn back shad. <laughs> oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so let's hit a couple more of these comments. Isaac says, uh, Early season, many holes. Late season, only the energy for much fewer holes with the hand auger. I understand that. Um, Elliot says, use a LXL handheld. It reads through the ice. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Christopher says, you got to get it in Pam Snow Bear, the ultimate ride. Okay. So t tell us about the Snow Bear. We got, I got to hear it. Uh, I, I, too bad I didn't have a picture, but uh, if you look it up later, um, they're called snow bears, so S N O bear, and uh, they are they are like a they are like a big snowmobile. They are a big snowmobile that um, that is fully enclosed, and it has four holes inside and hydraulics that go up and down, and you drive out on the ice with it, and it's heated inside. You get to your fishing spot. You drop the hydraulics down right to the ice, drill your hole, and you're inside the entire time. You're fishing in shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> That's pretty cool doing that while you're out on the ice. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, you, you could talk me into going in the snow bear for, for sure. <laughs> Let's get a couple more of these. Michael Cobb says made it. That's a buddy of mine. We got 
Uh, Ty says howdy. William says, uh, please talk about what you like in the Freedom lineup, specifically what you're using to target walleye through the ice. I think we've covered that fairly good so far, William. Uh, also, the technique you're using to fish these baits, minnow spoons, turn back shad, etc. cetera. Uh, we, we didn't talk a whole lot about the minnow spoon. We, we, we've kind of talked about the turn back shad pretty good. So you have yeah. anything to add to that, Sean? So those, those are the two minnow spoons. This is the original uh, here, and uh, this is the, the, newer, the newer model that's come out that's called the, uh, the hammer. The hammer minnow spoon. Um, so they they have a very unique fall. Um, most spoons, as you know, has its you know it's up and down. It's up and down. You know mm -hmm. this the the line ties on the middle, and it literally just all the way down to the bottom. So you just you know you lift it up about three four feet, and you just let it go all the way down. Lift it up all the way down, and that's all you got to do. And that that slow wobble is like if you ever took a little minnow fish, threw it in the water that was dead, and that's how it goes down to the bottom. It just kind of just kind yep. of hovers down all the way to the bottom. So the walleye or, or the pike or the, or anything, the perch will see that, and they're like, "Oh, look, a free meal!" And they'll just come up, and that's that's how you get it. Well, that's awesome. You know, and, and, and all these baits that we're talking about, you know, if you go to AmericanBaitWorks.com and, uh, you know, you can check it out. Anything from, you know, from Freedom, all these baits we've been talking about from Freedom. But there's something else that, that we want to talk about a little bit, too, uh, is another company that's under the American Baitworks umbrella from. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there was I just saw Manny said something about and I was just getting ready to bring this up. Do you use the Drifter for walleye? So the Drifter is a bait from set Lures, which, and guess what? Sean just happens to have a pack of them right there. Uh, but so that, so that's a bait that I personally caught a ton of smallmouth on. Um, but, but so the drifter's working through the ice too. Give, give us a little bit about that, Sean. Well, this is going to, this might surprise a lot of people, but one of, one of the, a great technique is drop shotting through the ice. Who would have thought? You yeah. drop shot through the ice, and 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 you catch walleye drop shotting. And uh, I always have one one rod that's rigged up with a drop shot, and usually I have the drifter on. The white white is usually my favorite color for that. Um, and uh, and even on other lakes, there's another popular lake just south of me, a couple of hours called Lake Simcoe, um, and that's a big bass lake as well. <laughs> Some big well, in, in Simcoe, big ones. Yeah, in the winter time, big lake trout, big whitefish, and they will they will fish these drifters on the set the hook flatty jig. Yeah, and and it gets to a point that you can't buy these drifters anywhere around Lake Simcoe. That's wow. how good they work. It it's. It's like I could sell if, if if I was if I was in the business to sell these, you know, to make a profit. <laughs> I don't know if Peter would like that, but I could probably sell these for twenty dollars a bag. Nice, nice. Now these yeah. guys that are targeting these guys that are targeting the whitefish and targeting the the, the big lake trout. Are, is that just for sport, or, or are those good to are those good to eat too? Oh yeah, they're eating them. Uh, they're 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 more of an oily fish, so a lot of people smoke them. But yep. uh, no, they're eating them, especially the white fish. A lot of people like white fish, um, so so that's a big thing. Uh, we do a lot. Of, hook just I ahead. was gonna, we we do a lot of uh, uh, you know fishing offshore and stuff, and, and catch mackerel sometimes, and they're kind of oily, but they make an awesome fish dip. You know, you yeah. mix in some green cheese and some stuff. I bet you those white fish will probably be exactly the same. Probably cool. yeah. So so set the hook uh, came out with a with a dart minnow. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen these yet, um, but these these are these are great as well. They're a little they're a little two point uh, two point three inch, and uh, great on the drop shot. Um, great on great on a little jig on 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 the zodiac jig. You know the 
the the famous zodiac jig that uh, Freedom has uh, for for whitefish with that with that that dark minnow. Um, they're nice and small because a whitefish has a very small mouth. So mm. so these work really well for that. And obviously any panfish that you're after as well. But but these are probably going to be great in the summertime even for drop shotting as well. So show, show us how, how are you rigging that Zodiac head with the dark minnow on the back of it? Are, are you are you just doing it through the nose? Are you threading up on the hook? Like, like how exactly are you yeah. doing that? I'll show you right now. Boy, those stink like garlic. <laughs> Perfect. Just like that, just just through the tip like that, and because okay. it's got the it because freedom has the free free swinging hook, mm -hmm. you can sit that down on the bottom, and that's gonna just hover up there, and and the white fish will come. They're bottom feeders, right? So they're they're gonna come in. They're gonna go like that, and that that's where that's where you're perfect. So just just kind of nose hooked, almost like a drop shot, you know. That it's got a lot of action. Like I'm not even moving my hand, and that thing keeps moving. Moving. So you can imagine being in the water in yeah. the current, and then and then w not only the bait being that good from set the hook, but then the zodiac head, like you mentioned, you know, being from Freedom, of course, it has that. It's it's not a solid hook all the way through it. It has the break, so there's plenty there's plenty of movement in there. So man, I bet that thing really just yeah. lays on the bottom and just kind of, you know, just like like love that thing. So that's yeah. that's pretty. Cool. Let's, let's hit. Uh, it looks like we got. Bay tackle supply on here. That's a little uh, link to one of the things we were talking about. Here's one from Brian that says, "What's the best bibs and jacket to wear?" It's a good question. If you're talking about, it, you know what? It's not a good question if if you're in the snow bear. You, apparently, you don't. Need well, yeah, them. <laughs> exactly. If you're in the snow bear, you don't need them. But um, <laughs> myself, I I I use. Uh, an FXR uh, suit. And the reason I do is they have a flotation in them. Uh, they're called fast flotation. So uh, if God forbid I ever fell through the ice, it would keep me up. So it's almost like a survival suit, but not as bulky. And it's, and it's a, a full floater. Um, you know, that's something that we're, we're really into safety. You know, my, my wife has one. I have one. We always want to make sure that, you know, just in case, you never know. Because like they say, no ice is safe ice. And yeah. uh, that will help you float. So that that's what I wear. Um, a lot of guys like the uh, the Striker, the Striker ice brands and the clams. Um, but if, if it was up to me, I'd get something that floats. And that's why I do the FXR. That, that's it's awesome that you say that because I really I really wasn't aware that they they had suits like that. But I mean, once you say it, I'm like, yes, that's that's something, yes. <laughs> something you would need for sure. I, I we had talked about hunting a little bit ago, and, and I never go up a tree stand anymore unless I have my harness on, you know. And that's kind of the same thing you're talking about, you know. It's it's basically the the same thing for being out on the ice. So uh, let's go through a couple more of these comments. Manny says. I live by Simcoe, no ice here. I don't know if he's if he's being funny or if no, it's no, it's been a it's been a mild mild year, so Simcoe's uh, late on freezing as well. Yeah, maybe so, maybe so. Uh, Christopher says, JT, if we told you Nipissing is like headwaters with ice on it in the winter, but with more species, would you come up? Yes, I probably would. As long as I can go in the snow bear, I would absolutely go up there. So I actually have to go to Iowa next week, so I'll get a little bit, little taste of the cold weather here. And I know, I know everybody's yeah. gonna laugh, but but believe it or not, in Florida, which this is completely different. Don't think I'm <laughs> trying to say that it's as cold down here as it is up there. But we've actually had a colder winter this year in Florida, and it's kind of funny that you say you guys are kind of behind up there. Because we've had a lot more, and once again, I know it's different, but everything being relative, like last the last two winters, I'll bet you we didn't have literally two or three nights in two winters that it got below 50 degrees. 
this year, just in the couple of days of January that we've had in December, I'll bet you we've had 20 nights that were in the 40s and 10 nights that were in the 30s. We've had more winter this year. And once again, I know that's not really what, but you know, everything being relative to us, yeah. that is, that is cold. like, it's been a lot colder this year than the last two or three years combined. Like, uh, you know, so, um, and who knows, Mother nature always has a way of equaling things out. So maybe February and March will be 80 degrees every day. Who knows? But, but the fish are still, the fish are still biting pretty good, but, but I'm just enthralled at learning all this stuff about, you know, about you guys and, 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 you know, and how you're fishing through the ice. And, and there's so many similarities about, about what we're doing, you know, just like we were talking about, you know, whether it's a rock transition to stand or, or, you know, whether it's the, the green weeds, you know, big field of grass, but there's one little place of green weeds in it. But one thing we haven't talked too much about yet, I mean, we've talked all about baits and, you know, all from American Bait Works brands, whether it's Set the Hook or whether it's Freedom Lures, go to AmericanBaitWorks.com. You can use that. Uh, we have some discount codes for you guys. You can use uh, the discount code Kenny ABW, or I, I don't know if you have one too, but it would be your, your yep. last name and, and, then, and then ABW on there. You can get a discount. Exactly. But one of the things we really haven't talked about we talked about baits and we talked about technique and we talked about where to catch them. What kind of tackle do you use as far as rods, reels, line, that kind of stuff? What, 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 and you can talk about name brands or not, just lengths, action. You know what I mean? Just break it down for us a little bit. Like, are, are you straight up uh, tip ups or are you actually, well, tip ups are all, are all live bait stuff. But when you're, when you're using the, the turn back shad and all that, that would be with, with, with rods. So, so this is uh, this is a 30, 32 inch. So it's a thirty-two inch uh, medium rod. Um, I don't have a reel with me, but we would use like a, a five hundred series or a, or seven hundred and fifty series a reel. Um, a spinning recoil reel. Recoil guide. Yeah, spinning reel. Yeah, recoil yeah. guide. So when the ice gets up here, you just flick it off. You know, they got them right up here, all over the place. Yep. Um, but yeah, like the, the, the 30, anywhere between 28 and 34, uh, inches for a rod, uh, is what, is what we use now line line is, is, is very similar to how I, what I'd use for, for my bass spinning gear. I use a, a 15 pound braid, uh, mm -hmm. to an eight pound fluorocarbon leader. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, so pretty, that's, that's pretty interesting. So let me ask yeah. you this. Do you use any like certain as far as for the extreme cold temperatures you're talking about, uh, you know, angling in? Do you use any kind of like conditioner for the for either the fluorocarbon or the braid, uh, anything like that? So they they sell specific ice line. Um, if you're fishing outside a lot, you're gonna want you're gonna want that um, because you're outside and the elements, the wind. But if you're inside the snow bear in your shorts, <laughs> I love that. You don't need any of it. <laughs> you just straight up braid and just go after it. Yeah, uh, that's it. Carbon leader, but you know what I mean? You don't have to, you know, but, but so say theoretically you were fishing outside out in the elements. Would, would you still use the same setup though? Would you still use braid to a fluorocarbon leader? No, I, I'd actually go to mono on the on when we're outside because uh, braid braid sheds off the water and then you just it has a bit like just freezes line like ice just on your line, so uh, at least there, at least mono takes a little bit of the water in so it doesn't freeze as, as bad as braid does. So uh, I always have one rod that has mono on it just for my outside fishing. But if I'm inside in a heated shack or or or, or a snow bear, then I, I always go braid. I like the feel of braid. Um, you could work the bait so much better, you know. So, but if I'm outside, then I'm going mono. Yeah. So so let me ask you this before we move on. One one last little little kind of tech question with that. <laughs> you said when you're in when you're in the snow bear, uh, we're, we're braid to floor later. How much leader do you use on that 
And does does the length of your leader compare to time of day, light penetration, uh, clarity? Water? I'm going to assume the water is probably pretty clear all the time. But uh, j just assuming. But it, it, w what do you do with that? Uh, I, I just uh, I do the same as I do in the summertime is I, I match my leader length to the length of my rod pretty much. So if I'm using a seven foot rod in the summer, I got a seven foot leader on. Um, with this, you're using a two foot rod, usually a two foot leader, anywhere between 16 and 20, 26 inches. Cool. So, so you don't feel like you need a really long, long leader? No. For that. No, no, no sense. Just, just enough that you know it, it, it helps you your fishing wise and. I just like it so it just doesn't get into the reel. That's all. Gotcha. 10-4. Let's, uh, let's hit a couple more of these. Um, here we got one from Matt that says, Sean, do you change your color profiles of baits based on time of day or depth? And like, well, it's kind of like what I was just asking you about the length of the leader, but this is kind of going back to the baits a little bit. You know, we were talking a lot about the Freedom Turnback Shad and the Freedom Minnow. What do you got for Matt on that? So uh, it, it definitely do. Um, you want to go to when it, when it's brighter out. I like something with more of a chrome finish uh, on the back of it because there is light penetration through the ice. So that will help. It'll flash a lot more um, this way when it's when it's not when it's not bright out. If you use something that flashes better. It is is much better, and then when when it is bright out, you go to a gold color, um, and uh, it just it just helps that way. So yeah, we do we do change up our colors in regards to uh, to depth and water clarity as well. Um, you know they they come in they come in all sorts of colors. This is a nice mute color, right in in the black silver. Um, so, and it all depends on what kind of forage you're trying to, to imitate, right? Most of the time they're eating perch around here. So that's why I go to, I go to that one, you know, but if, if I went to somewhere where it was more of a, more of a smelt bite or, or, or a minnow bite, then, then you're going to go to the black silver. So, but, uh, but that, that's what we do. Uh, so yeah, you definitely change up your colors. It's not, it's not only one. So do you you get a lot of the alwives up there too. I heard you talk about smelt. Do you guys have the alwives up there? Uh, not on Nipissing. We do have alwives up here, but uh, the main forage up here is smelt and and perch would be the main forage up here. Um, right. But yeah. Cool. Um, so, and, and another thing I was going to say, how like you said, like if we were going fishing tomorrow, it, it, twenty feet's been the been the ma magic depth. What's the shallowest throughout the year that you go, and what's what's the deepest? Just curious, oh, my curiosity alone. I, we've got some more questions here, but I'm asking more questions than, than I'm letting, this, letting our fans ask. So seriously, I'm so, just curious. So every yeah, so every lake obviously is different. Every species is different. But let's say you're in this lake tomorrow uh, for walleye. Uh, we've caught them as shallow as four feet. Mm -hmm. And as deep as thirty-five feet. So, so there's there's a big range, but you know, four feet's amazing. When you get them on that flat, that's a four-foot flat, and they're up there feeding. It's usually at night. It's just fantastic fishing. You you don't even have to reel them up. You just drop the line down because it's yeah. only four feet. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, but but if you if you went into a in, into into lake trout, for example, sometimes you're fishing in a hundred feet of water, right? So so it all it all depends on. Now now let's but let's tell the the, the guys at, at home, the guys and girls that are listening. Are you talking about catching them on the bottom at a hundred feet, or you might be thirty feet down, you might be sixty feet down, you might be you know whatever. Where where are we on that? So so yeah, lake trout. Once the once the lake turns over, they uh, once the thermoclines turned over, they they fluctuate up and down throughout the water column. Um, I have uh, this is one of my favorite ways to catch them. This is the the new. There's not even packaging on it. See, that's how new it is. But it's from Set the Hook. It's it's a swim bait, 
And uh, one of the best ways to catch lake trout is you drop this down 80 feet, let's say, and then mm -hmm. just reel it up, reel it straight up. And that, and that tail, that tail will start kicking all the way up. And then once you're watching your sonar, you're going to see a big line come through and start following you up. And, and that's, and that's lake trout. And sometimes they're in 80 feet. Sometimes they'll show up in 30 feet. So, so they're, they're all over the place. Um, but yeah, but white fish, yeah. On the bottom in 80 feet. Yeah. Cool. We got, we have a, speaking of, we were talking about, uh, Lakers there. Brian says I run braid when jigging for Lakers inside my trap guide on Lake O when it freezes. I assume he's yeah. talking about Lake Ontario. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's pretty good. So is is that what you're running? Are you running straight braid when you're doing Lakers too? I know we were talking about what you did with with like the turnback shad and walleye fishing, but yeah. when you're when you're fishing for lake trout, are you running straight braid? Yeah, I run straight braid with lake trout. It's more of an aggressive bite, so I, I really don't never tip with with uh, fluorocarbon because it's not needed. It's it's an aggressive strike. They're 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 attacking it. They're not. They're not line shy. Is what you're getting at, even though, even oh, though, it's, yeah. even though it's a basically a clear water fishery. Is there any time when you're when you're ice fishing that you run into stained water, muddy water, or is it pretty so, much just nice and clean most of the time? Usually, it'll stay clean. Very rare that I'll get you'll get uh, sediment. You'll get sediment through there, but uh, once it gets further on in the season. It gets really clean um, because it's cold water, and that's it. Cool. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I would think when it has, like, a cap on it, it can't really get dirty because of wind yeah. or, or there's not enough melt for the runoff. I guess in the, in the spring, once the ice melts, this is just yes. my own curiosity taking over. Do you guys tend to get some some stained and dirty water at that point in the spring when when stuff starts melting and it starts running in? Yeah, and that's when we start looking for clean water. <laughs> well, we're always doing that down here, looking for clean water. So uh, let's have another one. Here we got Tristan says, <laughs> and JT making that braid skin. I think he's probably talking about making the braid sing down here down here in the marsh but it's still it's still braid it'll still sing through a hole in the ice too um christopher says uh it's amazing catching them out of four feet i bet that is pretty cool too and when you're when you're fishing that shallow i can imagine that it would be i, I would think when you're in 20 feet the fish is straight down most of the time but when you're in four feet he's going out and going this way or going out and going that way that, that's yeah. probably pretty, pretty interesting deal too. So here we got uh, uh, Christopher again. He uh, Tillicum Bay is that? Am I saying that right? Tillicum Bay. Yeah. Yeah, that's where feet. I'm located. F facing the shore, deep water points right behind you, thirty plus feet. Cool. Yeah, but, that's exactly that's where I'm located. Actually, I'm I'm sitting on the shores of that right there. <laughs> really nice. That's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, man, Sean, I appreciate you being on here. Our hour's just about up. Um, everybody that's on here, I hope we got to get everybody's questions. Um, like I said, all of the stuff we talked about, well, most of the stuff we talked about, um, go to AmericanBaitWorks.com. Sean, what, what's, what's your code again at American Bait Works? I, I'm pretty sure it's it's the same as yours, just Aruda. It would be A-R-R-U-D-A-A-B-W. Yep, A R R U D A uh, slash yeah. A B W, and or you can hit Kenny A B W, either one. But use Sean's if you can. Um, you can go there. You can get a discount. I don't remember exactly what it is, um, but you get a discount. AmericanBaitWorks.com on all the baits that we talked about tonight. Um, I'm sure there's some pretty cool places. I know we had that Bay Country. I think it was on there. Uh, maybe some of the other stuff. Bay that we yeah. Bay tackle supply, maybe some of the other stuff we talked about. You could probably go to them and find all that stuff. Um, I'm super glad everybody stopped by tonight. I really enjoyed, uh, you know, talking to Sean and 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 really getting to to talk about ice fishing, which is something that I, I've done three to four times in my life, but but really haven't got to speak 
to like a straight up expert about it. You know what I mean? Like the guys I went, no offense, but the guys I went and did it with, we really didn't know what the hell we were doing. We were just, <laughs> out there. we had fun. Don't get me wrong. We caught some perch and we caught some bluegills and we had a great fish fry. You know, it's fun, but to really get to, you know, bend the ear of, of somebody that really knows what's going on and knows what baits to use, why to use them, you know, when, when, when to change to do this and, and what you were talking about with the going between the smell and, and, and the perch colors and all that stuff, man. Sean, we really appreciate you being on here. This has been another episode of American Bait Works Live. And everybody, I'm almost positive that next Wednesday night at six o'clock, we'll be doing another American Bait Works Live. So everybody, thanks for stopping and we are signing off.